all over the place. Good. So uh, welcome all to the MIS Journal Editors panel. It's a great honor for me to, to hold this, host this panel with such a beautiful audience and the great panelists we have here today. Uh, Aurora, Miguel, and Fred. The main idea of this panel is to discuss if and how Latin America studies are welcome in top international MIS journals. While we see that Latin American IS researchers are increasingly publishing studies in those journals, uh, the vast majority of us still face difficulties in doing impactful research, communicating properly in academic January. And as a, a consequence, having our papers accepted even in the editor's desk review. Let me tell you what happened today after my lunch. I opened my mailbox and I had a paper of my co-authorship desk rejected in one of those outlets. <laughs> So uh, I know what I'm talking about. This panel will be a great opportunity for me too, to learn from uh, the panelists. Everything happens for a reason. Each panelist will have some 10 or 15 minutes to speak before we open the discussion to the audience. The panelists are Dr. Aurora Sanchez, Associate Professor at Universidad Católica del Norte, Antofagasta, in Chile, uh, who is a co-editor of La Caes. Dr. Miguel Aguirre Urreta, who is uh, faculty director of the Innovation Hub, associate professor at the Department of IS and Business Analytics at the College of Business, Florida International University. Dr. Fred Niederman, endowed professor of management. Please help me in pronouncing this word. Chai Fetz? Chai Fetz? School of Business, St. Louis University who is the Editor-in-Chief of Communications of the AIS, and myself, Associate uh, Carlo Bellini, Associate Professor of MIS at uh, the Federal University of Paraíba, Universidade Federal da Paraíba, Brazil. And I am currently a Senior Editor of uh, IT and People. Well, uh, we didn't discuss um, the sequence of uh, uh, the panelists, may I suggest that Aurora be the first, ladies first, or whoever? Okay, no problem. Yeah. No problem. Okay. okay. So, so Aurora, please Thank you. welcome and feel free to. Thank you, Carlo and, and, and Isla for having the opportunity to present our journal that is RECASI, Revista Latinoamericana del Caribe and the Information System. I see if I can share my screen. Yeah, I can do that. And um, I will present uh, very shortly uh, our journal. I'm very pleased to, to be part of it. The editor, um, Walter Moreno, uh, is, uh, is in charge of the journal, but I will, I'm the, I'm the senior editor. So Ray Cassi is a is a is a journal that belongs to the to the AIS and, and it represents the Latin America and the Caribbean community. It is part of our our chapter, you know, and also of uh, of the whole Latin American community. I will present some introduction about the how the journal was born. I will present who is the today the editorial the editorial board. Uh, how in which stage we are and uh, some next steps that we are following. First, I want to say that everybody knows, you know, uh, how the Red Cassie uh, started. This is a journal 
that uh, started as a part of a very ambitious project uh, at, uh, that was aiming to disseminate and uh, research in MIS in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, then the first step in this uh, the, step, the first step in this in this um, process was uh, starting to having AMSIS 2006 in Acapulco. That's the reason Guillermo is there. And then in uh, in 2010 we have Lima in Latin America too. So they, this was uh, initially the first step. And then we started having all on those conferences, a Spanish and Portuguese presentations. And then we realized that the, we didn't have a outlet where those presentation in Spanish and Portuguese could be presented. Then we decided to start uh, this, this journal uh, called Revista Latinoamericana um, uh, y del Caribe del, de la Asociación de Sistemas de Información and starting to, if, uh, using, you know, requesting those author to, you know, present the, the, the papers to the journal, you know? So it was open to most researchers and practitioners to present the ideas through a high quality scholarly and applied manuscript. Then, and this journal not only accepts research paper, but also research in progress report, teaching cases, and innovative IT project. Uh, and mainly the journal was aiming to foster a dialogue, to, to try to make a dialogue in, in, in the, uh, among the, the Latin American community in MIS and creating uh, you know, a, a, a source where uh, Spanish and Portuguese research could be found. That uh, this was a major point uh, among the discussion in the Latin American chapter of the, of the uh, Association for Information System, because we realized that we didn't have place to put our research in our own language. Uh, we uh, in, in RELCASI Rel uh, accept papers in, in, in English, Spanish, or Portuguese. The only requirement that we have as is the, in English as the paper should have something related with the Spanish, uh, in Spanish project or a Spanish you know, development. So uh, we are reaching a very wide and varied, uh, a, a wide community that include uh, 33 uh, cultural and you know, diverse states with population of more than 60, 640 million people. Half of them are Spanish speakers and the other half is Portuguese speakers. So we have a very big you know, uh, population to serve. And we're very happy because uh, we are having, you know, uh, this conference in Isla, which is a big, you know, a space to to show what Latin American researchers are doing. You know, uh, Red Cassi uh, attempts to promote a, a, a very important discussion related to what is happening to our organizations and the government in Latin America. All, all our research that has been published at, uh, until now uh, as a point to some, to some important issues happening in mainly in, in our countries. Uh, this, is a, this is a very, you know, I could say, cherish, you know, uh, result of our chapter in, in Latin America, and we hope that we can continue having it. At that time, now, we have, uh, have published since 2008, uh, 13 volumes and 57 articles. And, and from countries like Brazil, Bolivia, Chile, Peru, Mexico, Venezuela, and uh, this uh, this is the web page of the of the of the of the journal. You can find it in the AIS library, e library, and it's uh, I could say very proudly that this is this is an AIS journal, and we have here in this uh, uh, in the with us today, Alexandre Grammel. Indira Guzman, uh, Jose Antonio Robles also, who has been very uh, hard working so hardly. So we could reach this number that you could see here. This is 2000, 2020, 2020, because it was a, a little delay in the journal for many years. Uh, we assume with Walter and the whole group I mentioned uh, in order to get the, the journal you know, uh, updated. And uh, we are very happy now that, that the journal is having is receiving papers through B Press in in the AIS system. We are receiving uh, research that is uh, mainly uh, from from 
from Latin Americans, uh, educational systems, and, and researchers that are, are studying MIS. And we open, you know, we open to receive journal articles for all people here. So I encourage everybody to just think about the journal, try to, to see we are going to publish good research in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. I think this is a very interesting, and we have tried to be very, very inclusive of the three languages. And this is something that probably is our main point you know, that we want, we want to keep. This is the, the website where you can connect to just to not only to, to, to look at the journal, but also to send, uh, submit the articles. Uh, and we, uh, the committee will, will uh, analyze and see them. Yeah. I wanted to say that uh, we invited all, all, all research presented at ISLA because we wanted to publish an issue for RECASI uh, based on ISLA this year. So I, I encourage everybody who has a uh, think that the journal uh, could be published uh, to send it to, to RECASI and we will be very glad to receive them. Well, this is uh, our journal. I want to thank everybody. And I mainly, I think um, I'm in, in name of, of Walter Moreno, who is, is the, the editor in chief of the journal. He could not be here, but I'm um, uh, beside Alexandra Indira, who is here, and 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 also um, the rest of the committee, Jose Antonio. Uh, uh, thank for for everybody who have been working very hard. I could say work weeks and weeks uh, to just update the journal, and uh, we are very happy to to have a, a, an article already 2021. Thank you, Carlos. That was my presentation. Good, thank you, Aurora. Um, so now, uh, Miguel or, or Fred, um, I didn't ask Ale Alexandre if, if uh, the audience is supposed to, uh, to, to, to manifest at the end. I think so. Whenever. So, uh, whenever, whenever, uh, Carlo, uh, uh, at any time, yeah, whenever you wish. Because, because we have different outlets, different journals, so maybe some, someone. Yeah. But, but may, maybe, maybe we could question. have questions at the end so that everyone exposed their ideas. Good. So if we do not have anyone to, to ask uh, a question to Aurora uh, right now, we can ask the other. Uh, panelists to to present their journals. Fred, Fred, do you want to go next, or I can yes. go? I can be next. Either way, just let me know when you want me to go. So Miguel, why, why don't you go ahead, Miguel? <laughs> well, sure, I'll go ahead. Um, uh, okay, so thank you, Carlo, for the for the introduction. Uh, for the purpose of the panel, I'm a senior editor at the Database for Advances in Information Systems. Sorry uh, for the introducing. <laughs> uh, the database is, uh, let's see, Tom Stafford and Deb Armstrong are the editors in chief. I've been a, a senior editor there since hmm, 2013, so it's been a while. Uh, the journal started, I think, in 1969. It's one of the oldest mainstream, I don't know if it's the oldest, but one of the oldest uh, mainstream uh, MIS journals out there. It is not part of the AIS. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, published by the Special Interest Group in MIS from the ACM, so it's an ACM journal. I would categorize it as a generalist journal. There's not a particular uh, bent towards one type of research or other. I was, while we were starting today, I was browsing the, the last few issues and you see everything from you know, adoption research, there's a job satisfaction research, there's some privacy, there's some security, some blockchain, some philosophy of research. So there's anything from the, the more hardcore technical type of research on blockchain, all the way towards, you know, why are we here and what are we doing type of, of papers. So there's quite a bit of, of, of gamut there. Um, I want to talk a bit about the, the approach that I take for uh, when, I, when I get research. 
Uh, going back to Carlos' point about desk projects and so on, and there's some, I, I think, ongoing discussion as to when and how we want to use we want to use that tool. I, I rarely have desk projected uh, paper. I think I've done it once. So one time that I really didn't see absolutely anything happening there. Uh, it may be that by the time Tom and Dev assign the papers to us, they have done their check and they have, I would assume that's the case. I, I do read uh, absolutely everything that, that I get assigned. Uh, and only then I figure out whether there is, um, there is something you know, worth sending out for review. I, I tend to be, I, I try to balance the amount of work that we put as authors in sending our research, which is a lot, uh, with the amount of work that needs to happen behind the scenes uh, in terms of editorial time and then reviewer time and, and so on. Uh, and so on the one hand, I tend to err on the side of the authors in terms of, unless I really do not see anything happening, I will send it out for review to see if somebody else uh, who is maybe closer to the area uh, sees value there. So I will err on that side. Uh, but at the same time, I, I try to protect the time of the reviewers. So when a paper clearly is not going to happen, and after two rounds of reviews, there's really nothing that can be done. Then it's time to, to pull the plug and, and, and you know, let the reviewers be and let the, the authors be. Uh, I, I take on two types of assignments, a database typically, um, either uh, those related to, to human computer interaction, which is my substantive area of, of interest and where I did my, my dissertation work. Uh, so anything regarding you know, computer self-efficacy and, and HCI and computer anxiety and stuff like that, I, I do take to get a database. And I also get papers that are either uh, methodological in nature, because I've done a lot of my research on, on quantitative methods. I do not touch qualitative papers, period. They are great to read, but I'm not qualified to, to uh, see them. So I get either papers that are heavily in methods themselves or papers that have uh, some degree of methodological complexity that is that is not that common. And I, I, I the kind of person that actually enjoys uh, looking at complex methods and trying to figure out how they're being used and so on. So uh, th that's my, my, my overall approach to it. I will, I will tend to err on the side of the authors. Uh, so to send out for review, unless I really don't see any, any avenue for, for a paper moving forward. Uh, but I also am mindful of, you know, there's, there's a lot that happens behind the counter to make a journal uh, happen. And then there's a lot of work that happens on that end, which is um, much less recognized than when you or we as an author publish something. So I'm mindful of, of protecting everybody's time. Um, I think that's it. Hopefully that, that makes sense. Carlo, do you want me to just start in? Good, good, thank you. Uh, so I, I, I was will... looking for the, the buttons, the, the, the right buttons. Like... <laughs> so I, I would um, second everything Miguel said. Um, the authors who are least patient often are the same ones that don't have much sense of just how much volunteer time and effort is being spent on them. They're kind of like teenagers, you know. I, I don't have any kids, but I've met a few teenagers occasionally. Uh, they, you know, they, um, they, they see the, the um, reflection in the window, but not the forest on the other side of it. Um, I didn't think about telling you a lot about communications of ACM, you know, how many readers we have and all this, it's history. By the way, the database was the second IS journal after MIS Quarterly. And they were both started by the same group in Minnesota. Uh, a database is part of ACM and it's spun out from, uh, from Minnesota about, I'm gonna say 30 years ago. And Georgia State people uh, took it over, Eve McLean, and Mark Kyle and some others. And it's been uh, run by the same special interest group on computer personnel research. 
and special interest group on MIS. MIS is like the third oldest special interest group in ACM. Uh, it, it happened when computer science people realized that just building systems didn't get them to actually be used by anybody. But, but that's a whole other history. Um, what I wanted to talk about a little bit comes from my experience with a different journal called Journal of Global Information Management. And, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this. So one of the, so I've written a fair amount in what's called Global Information Systems. Uh, my first published accepted journal article uh, that I did on my own was looking at what's called group support systems as used in Mexico. And I was supported by Monterey Institute of Technology to interview group facilitators and people using the technology. And my theory was from the cultural literature that since on statistical entries, Mexico and the US are near the opposite ends, uh, and individualism and all these things, that the reception would be the opposite in Mexico from the US. And my finding was 180 degrees different. At least in the subset of population in Mexico, there was actually, to my great surprise, tremendous pride in being US-like because this group of people associate with being modern and efficient. Now, you know, the US projects many different faces and we don't all have the same view all the time, as does Mexico, you know as does every country, Brazil. We all have our varied realities that external people see. So I found that to be very interesting and it was published in Journal of Strategic Information Systems, I think, uh, way back. Now, my experience with this journal is that it aims at global information systems. Well, what is that? Now, what information aren't global? SAP is global. Microsoft is global. I remember a time about 30, 25 years ago when there was expected to be a huge boom in Chile for basically translating software from English into Spanish and developing whole new markets. Now, I, I honestly don't know if that's happened or not because I've never seen anybody five years later go back and find out. By the way, there's a wonderful journal article, and I don't remember what the journal was, by a fellow named Michael Myers, Dove Eindor, not Dove, um, something Eindor from Israel, and somebody from Holland or Denmark that looked at the software industry in all three countries and asked how the national economic strategies played into the kind of software that was developed and marketed and the kind of skills that were transmitted in countries. It's a very, very good paper. I've never seen a follow-up in about 30 years that looked at other countries and their software industries. So this is all getting to the point that few papers that are about global information systems and culture get into basket of eight journals. I assume you all know what I mean by basket of eight. These are supposed to be general, so-called high quality journals. Uh, I would say they're precise. They weed out a lot, anything really interesting or poorly constructed is weeded out. So you get lots and lots, my personal opinion, of B plus, A minus articles. But in database, you get everything from the Ds and Fs to the A pluses. And that means in my view, the handful of really great papers are often from the databases, the CISs. And I find that people tend to have a mixture of two motivations in publishing. One motivation is success at their school and recognition. And the other is making a contribution to the community. Some of us are at schools that are relatively light in their grading criteria, so we can just max out on contribution. And if our papers are accepted, fine. If not, we just try another one. By the way, 
you mentioned uh, having a desk reject. I had a reject on a first round. It was close to a desk reject last week. I talked to a former uh, president of AIS who got desk rejected this week. So this is ubiquitous. The question is not getting desk rejected. It's what do you do next? And the answer to what you do next is if there's usable uh, um, um, feedback, you upgrade your paper. Then you send it to the next closest journal. After about three, I get disgusted and send it to a journal where I know it'll get accepted. Mainly because I put a $50 bill. No, just kidding. Just kidding. When I send it, in. can't do it anymore on email. Anyway, just that's just a joke. Uh, not a funny one, I admit. Uh, so my point just is that um, talent and good work are no guarantee of publication. Lack of talent is almost a guarantee of not publishing. Uh, having four, five, six rejections before something gets accepted is a sign of constant improvement. Uh, we can blame the editors, which is usually justified, or we can say, what do I do better next time? Now, I don't mean better in some universal sense of, oh, I'm terrible. Sometimes it's a question of being a contrarian in a paradigm that's very regulated. So then you just have to look for where your kind of contrarianism is accepted. I could tell you story after story about that. But it could also be that you use the XYZ linear square model and your editor doesn't like the XYZ, they like the ABC. Something I recommend people to do is if there are three choices for linear square, and I have no idea. Uh, Michael and I'd be a good team because I don't, I don't do any quality, quantitative anymore. I just have to send them to good AEs that know about it, right? Or good senior editors. And then, and then review it and try to keep up a little bit. But my, my point is that I tell people, do all three of them. It's, you know, eight more keystrokes on SPSS. And then in a footnote, you say, look, I tried all three. This one has this strength, this has this strength, this has this strength. This one had the closest fit. That one is the strongest test, you know, but they all have the same result. And nine out of 10 times, whenever I've done that, the results have been without a 0.01 p-value difference, right? Now, if my p-value is 0.049, and then I get 0.051, well, reporting all of them is probably good enough for most people, but not probably for, you know, MIS quarterly. But you'll find some of you it is good enough for, right? But I think the biggest issue that I come across, and I'll get back to um, uh, global IT in a second. This issue I come across is contribution. I get a lot of literature reviews that are descriptive. That's not bad or evil. It's a very good start to a dissertation. On a rare occasion, it's a contribution of itself because the topic is so new. Problem with the new topic is there's no literature to review. So if you take two related li literatures and say, well, this is what we expect to find. Now you've got some, but it's that this is what we expect to find. This is what, if, if we have 10 papers on, I don't know, um, um, a, a, a privacy and blockchain, blockchain and privacy. And we, we come up with something and say, well, all 10 found this. Maybe we don't need to study it anymore. Or this might be something that we study only when blockchain changes enough to make it a big privacy difference, right? That now is a conclusion that adds value. So I would say the biggest desk reject I have are literature reviews that don't add much except sorting things out. Now, it's my sad belief that TAM is exhausted and Utah is exhausted. Now, in a paradigm that says we need more and more details, a, 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 a traditional science paradigm, more TAM. I just got a pretty good study about TAM when technology is required. And 
I, I, I didn't dislike it, but it's not in a kind of contrarian paradigm, which is what CEIS looks for. So I normally recommend a couple of other journals that they could go to. We have a journal called Transactions on AIS that likes that kind of paper. It's in a more within the area rather than let's expand and, and do things that are innovative. So getting back to global information, I wrote a paper for Journal of Global Information Management that said, why is it that almost no international business paper that you'll ever read references MIS? If there's a paper on Born Global, it says nothing about the technology that you want to choose to make that happen. If there's one on interconnecting a, 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 a transfer of knowledge across countries, nothing about the technology to do that. Now, if you do one on knowledge management in IS or on knowledge transfer in IS, there's nothing in international business. It's like the Berlin Wall that hasn't come down yet uh, uh, between international business. So that's what I wrote, is, is a paper that says, here are why IT people should read IB and why IB people should read IS. And here's a bunch of things that IS people especially could learn from IB. Now, why doesn't that get published more? I only have like 30 citations in, in 10 years on this. It's crazy. I would have thought I'd have hundreds because it's so central to the issue of global information management. But you see, people in basket of eight don't care. And I don't mean this derogatorily. They don't care if people implement SAP the same in Sao Paulo as they do in San Francisco. Either everybody does it the same, which is their assumption that goes unchallenged. Or, well, if you do Brazil, then you have to do Nicaragua, then you have to do, you know, uh, uh, and you can see you have to do 200 countries. We have the same problem, by the way, in human resource management and IS. HR people do not want papers about IT professionals because, well, why, then the next thing is we have accountants, then we have engineers, then we have nurses, and then the whole, the whole realm is thrown open to everybody. And we can't have that. We're just looking for the universals that apply to everybody. This, I think, is one of the things that you're going to run up with if you're really interested is how do we implement SAP for our clients here in Sao Paulo in an efficient and effective way? Because we know that 80%, so between 20 and 80% of the gringo stuff from America, from the US, sorry, I don't mean America, in the US or Germany, isn't going to work here because we have a different economic regime, different cultural regime, we have different clients. We have a company that you probably hate called Monsanto in town here in St. Louis. And they talk about how they do business in Brazil. They have a very big presence in Brazil. And, and their financial structures are arse backwards relative to the states. And they, they don't mind that at all. They love learning from both of them. Okay. Now, this is on the business side, not on the, you know, uh, poisons in the, in, the, in the environment side, okay? Anyway, so I don't mean to be pessimistic or crude, but if you're going for a basket of eight and you're doing how you implemented SAP in Sao Paulo, you have to both convince people that it has universal applicability and that there's something about what you learn in Sao Paulo that can be at least worthy of applying in New York or London also. Have uh, I gone way past my time? I usually do. Um, but I, I can go on and on. I look forward to answering questions. But if I were asked to give advice to, uh, say, my friend Alex, he's an experienced, longtime published person. But if he says, I want to do more in the basket of eight, I would say, well, then you either have to become part of the group that is Carnegie Mellon oriented, universalistic, or you have to sell something that's offbeat in their own terms 
that's going to be meaningful to them. Or you can say, look, I'm happy with IT&P and database and CIS. These are good journals read by a lot of people. We have far more downloads, by the way, than MIS Quarterly and ISR put together. We also have an education department, which we public. We had a special issue. Uh, Alex was one of our, uh, uh, Guillermo, you mentioned, is one of our AEs for it. We put it together 50, approximately, published eight to 10 page articles on what people actually do. We have a department for this. I'm much happier printing a 10 page paper on a new way that we invented a great way to incorporate entrepreneurship and IT in the intro class or in systems analysis class. Or we have a new class that teaches people how to do IS using blockchain. I, I love these papers. We're educators. 80% of AIS members do not teach at the Carnegie Mellon and the Monterey Techs of the world. They teach at schools where there is no PhD program, where your influence on the world is by teaching students who are going to go out and implement it. So you want them to learn as much as possible of the best as possible, taking out esoteric nonsense and putting in more of what's going to be helpful to them. My opinion. And I have four more hours of opinion. So that's basically what I wanted to communicate. Anything you want about CIS, my experience is global, um, you know, my experience competing in this other realm. Uh, I'm just I'm just delighted to be able to share it with you. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. So much. Uh, so uh, now I will briefly comment on uh, ITN people. Uh, this is the very first time I'm using uh, Zoom. So I'm trying to see how to share my screen. Do you see? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So, so um, since uh, 20, I go for ITN people. I think everybody knows this 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 journal, a very uh, traditional one since the 80s. And what I'm about to, to talk to you is uh, based on my experience with ITN people, but also as a former editor in chief of uh, Brazilian Administration Review, which is the flagship uh, journal of the Brazilian Academy of Management. And uh, because in ITN people, I didn't receive so far uh, papers from Latin America. So as this panel is about uh, uh, um, what we can maybe help Latin American researchers in those outlets, um, I think I will, I will comment more uh, based on my experience in, in EAR. Uh, so I think people just uh, some some information, some some metrics. This is the input factor. Uh, this year we have received so far uh, this number of submissions, more than two per day. If we divide the submissions uh, per number of days so so far this year, so uh, we receive a lot a lot of submissions. My experience as senior editor or my behavior as senior editor is much like Miguel's uh, behavior in, in database. Uh, I do not use the desk reject papers. I did it uh, so far, maybe once or twice, but usually um, we receive very good papers and uh, Usually, I, I send them out uh, to full review. And uh, currently, I think I, I'm managing about five papers. And they're good papers. Very good papers, I think. So, I tend to receive uh, four types of contributions, research papers, viewpoints, technical papers, conceptual papers, and case studies. I never received 
papers other than research papers. Not only as a senior editor, but also as a reviewer for these and other journals, I never review uh, documents other than research papers. So I, I, I'm not aware about the volume of submissions of documents uh, that are not research papers in MIT and people. Uh, So I organized only these uh, uh, this slide about what I see as the, the, the major problems with submissions when the authors are not experienced ones. And again, I am. Uh, I'm speaking from my experience mostly in Brazilian administration review. And the editorial process, I see it as a conversation. It is a serious conversation, but still a, con a conversation between the authors, the reviewers, and the editors. So, uh, when you have this in mind, I think you change how you communicate with the potential readers and you communicate to potential readers through your article and how you communicate with the editorial uh, um, people in the uh, revision letters. So I organized these items to, as my, my most intriguing or my perspective on the issues that must be more seriously addressed by authors from Latin America. And then I, would open to the audience uh, the microphone uh, for, for you to manifest your, your perspectives and also interact with the other panelists. So uh, the issues are, should I agree with and implement all of the review comments? I have my answer to this question, but think of, think of it. What should I do when reviewers have conflicting views? One reviewer says one thing and the other says the exact opposite of it. What the others should do. When and how can I use figures tables from other sources? It is a very basic issue, but still an issue for a number of authors. When and how can I use literal sentences from other sources? And of course, uh, since Brazilian Administration Review uh, is uh, fully published in English, uh, I realized that our peers here in Latin America need to better address this proper English, but also proper academic writing. It is a specific genre. It is not usual writing. It is not usual English writing. It is academic writing. It has its own ways to express ideas. Right? So this is what I, I have to, to share with you. And now I want to open uh, the microphone to the audience. First, let me see how to, to close my, my screen. It's at the bottom, Carlo. Sorry? It's at the bottom, the same place where you had the share screen. You, you can close that, stop sharing. It is because Zoom is in a very tiny screen. It is not in full screen. 
you touch the, you are viewing Carlos Bellini's screen, they said you touched it and then should, um, should stop it. Sorry, Aurora. Uh, you have to, to, to see up there where there's op view options and this, this menu are up there, then you have to touch it and then probably say close it. No? Do, do you see my desktop? Yes. Yes. I see your presentation. So, oh, stop, security participant, chat, new share. Oh man, I, I don't see. You have to you have to touch the you the, the, the where they, they say that you are presenting. Let me Sorry, know. stop share. Right. It's in green. Good. It's in green. Good. Yes. Thank God I don't. <laughs> Okay, I want to ask a Fred question since I'm I'm here. I I I really learning so much because uh, probably he's the the, the 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 editor, you know, of uh, with a high experience in this panel. And uh, I would like to know um, what you can suggest. The 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 people here in this conference are probably very new new researchers. Uh, what do what do you suggest to them? To, to just start just thinking about uh, journals in, in, in the level of your journal. Because we have a journal that this is the beginning. You don't have any index. It is not an index journal yet. But for you to, for them to think about uh, publishing in journals like yours. Um, I got, what, what, uh, there's a fellow named Alan Lee, who was the editor of MIS Quarterly for a number of years, uh, I don't know, 20 years ago. And I asked him once, how do you go about publishing in MIS Quarterly? And he gave me an answer that I did not expect at all. He said that you have to understand this is a social process, that there's a group of people who have a, uh, a common framework, not identical, but an overlapping framework. So if there's a journal that you're interested in, then say ITNP, for example, or database, then um, you start making sure to see that the kind of articles that are published are the sort of thing you'd like to do. And another thing you can do is you can um, contact uh, the editors in chief or the uh, um, senior editors and say that you'd like to review a paper and if it goes well, maybe review for them on a regular basis. Now, reviewing is a great way to learn about the journal. And it's a great way. See, we, we see the articles when they're finished. But we don't see the four revisions. And, and what they might have been shabby at the beginning. You know, I, I say half of the MIS quarterly articles, the day they're submitted, could be published in the end with the right editing and the right um, um, uh, um, author seriousness. Um, so what that means is that, you know, and they have a 5% uh, rate. So that means that about one out of 10 persists through the whole process. So understanding what that process consists of, what reviewers are looking for, what their attitudes are going to be. Then when you receive back a revise and submit, interpreting what that means and what you do with that. These are skills that are typically not taught in, in a research program, but that have to be nurtured and developed. Uh, another thing that's really good is, especially if you can collect data, let's say there's just been a recent um, set of articles about IT workforce collected in about 30 different countries around the world. And different people are publishing different papers on different subsets of the data collected. So if, um, um, let's see, um, I'm gonna get this mixed up, but Miguel, you were in um, Lima, if I remember right. Uh, no, I'm in Miami. Oh, Miami, oh, all yes. right, well. Uh, so let's say that, um, uh, uh, Carlo, did you say you were in Brazil? Yeah, it's okay. the most so of the Americas. Sorry? 
in the easternmost city of the Americas, João Pessoa. Okay, is that near Bahia? Uh, 1,000 kilometers north. Oh, okay, I get the idea then. All right, so let's say that he has data he can collect there, and I can make in St. Louis where I live, and I have some experience publishing, being a second author working with somebody that can do something like that can be a really excellent experience. Now, if you can do 60 or 70% of the, of the grunt work, that can convince somebody it's worth their time to do it with you. Just an example. Uh, but, you know, this is, these, are, these are a lot of little mini strategies. If you're 35 years old and you have 30 years ahead of you, then looking at the long game and building these skills slowly but surely, publishing in international journals like Journal of Global Information Management, and then attacking more and more, um, I shouldn't use the word attack, but elevating to different levels of international competition um, would be another strategy. Um, I think that people tend to think mostly about topics. Topics come and go. Artificial intelligence has come and gone five times in my career. Uh, you know, um, RFID used to be a big topic. I wrote about it 20 years ago. You won't even find it now anywhere, except the, in a few uh, networking ACM journals. So um, I think that having thematic interests, like e-government is a really good thematic interest. Um, if um, in Carlos town, the government is doing a new system for let's say something non-controversial like uh, um, paying your taxes. I guess that's controversial sometimes, but, and, it's a great system or a really bad system. By the way, there's a great article, um, the nameless is escape me in MIS Quarterly by a lady who is, I think from Serbia about voting in Brazil and voting systems. And it's a great example of process theory, uh, by the way, that's been published or coevolution theory, I can't remember for sure but it's a tremendous paper. So it's not impossible. It's just that it, she's addressing universalistic issues framed in the specifics of that area. Um, I'm sorry, go on and on all afternoon about this. Did I respond to your question, Aurora? Sure, thank you. I think it's, it's a very good advice for, for at least uh, for, for researchers that are starting. Our journal in case is receiving just uh, at the beginning, you probably are receiving just more experienced researchers. So it's a, it's a very good uh, answer. Thank you, Fred. Well, on Alex, a micro Fred. level, one other thing I'll say about this idea of responding to reviewers. Um, there are three things. One is they can say something that's actually quite clear and you just forgot to put something in. Then you just do it, right? It's like, it's like your advisor telling you to do something. The second are things where they're, they're really wrong. That they're telling you, I don't like your paper at all, but I don't have the guts to say so. So I'm gonna tell you a different paper I'd like to see you write. And I ignore them. Now, I try to write a diplomatic response. You know, basically, well, you know, this is outside our scope or whatever. Uh, on a rare occasion, I will write back and say, you know, this would make a great different paper, but it's not what we're aiming to do. Sort of take it or leave it. And, and then the third thing is, every time I write my response and I come back to it, I see new things in the, in the I often misinterpret. And it's often a simpler, more mundane point than I expect when I've read it the first time and more doable. It's also, you have to keep in mind, you'll get a reject from one of three on a revise and resubmit. And then you read it and you're like, 
I, I would accept this. It's, there's like nothing there. And you'll get an accept that's got like 50 things to change. So the ultimate judgment of a reviewer and their detailed reviews are not always congruent. And you have to allocate time in the whole process. If you're lucky and have a good set of reviewers and a good AE, you'll end up with a better paper than you thought you could do. If you have an average one, you'll end up with a published paper that's different from, but no better than what you started. And if it really stinks, you go somewhere else. Uh, I'll also say more than 50% of the studies I started have never been published because I, I just figure that it's too much trouble, that they're right, the reviewers are right, it needs this, it needs that, but that's not of interest to me to do. Okay. Thank you. I think I saw Alex's hand up. Thank you. No, I had my hands up uh, for a while, but I noticed that there are so many questions there, or uh, at least two or three questions in the also in the chat uh, mm -hmm. that unfortunately I cannot read from my little self uh, mobile phone here. But uh, if anyone I can, I can read. Uh, we have two questions. The first one by Adam. I don't know how to pronounce this name. Adam French. Just. Curious on your thoughts. I think this is to Fred. I think so. are these skills of management, managing the review process, not taught due to the hyper competitive nature of publishing, or are interpreting review such a, a tacit level knowledge that you can only learn by experience? This is a great question. Um, I think there I think there are some rules of thumb that are good to know in the background but don't always apply. You still have to use your judgment for each discrete uh, comment uh, and decide what category goes. In. But to know that there's categories is helpful. To know that you can push back up to a point, you know, diplomatically. I respectfully disagree, blah, blah, blah. Here's why. Um, another th problem that's a heuristic is I used to get as reviewer papers that would literally change even things that required more thinking and, I, and to minimize the revision time. And, and I, I usually rejected those or, or suggested a rejection. Um, reviewers and editors generally like to see some rethinking. Now, you always have the chance when you rechange something, you're adding new errors, like in programming, right? You know, you have new bugs when you fix things. And it could extend the time it takes, but it will end up in a better, in a better paper. Um, so I think there are some heuristics. I think that doing it with co-authors back and forth is a way to accelerate the process. But at the end of the, at the end of the day, I don't think I don't think it's tacit knowledge as much as courage of convictions. That you read it, you introspect what you feel about it, what you think, and what's going to work, to be honest, in terms of being, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, an advocate. Uh, and, and, then, and then you make your best guess. It's always a leap. You cannot eliminate risk. You can minimize it, but you have risks, whatever you do. And so you may as well do the things you believe in, because then if it goes wrong, you can be more righteously indignant. If you compromised, uh, then, then you, you, you know, then what do you have left? Thank you. Thank you. And we have a, a, a last question here from Pedro, my friend and colleague here in my university. Uh, if I may ask, how does the magazine of uh, you run view the open science movement and initiatives like archive.org? This is a question for everyone. Oh. Well, I can tell you very quickly, 
that oh, right. we yeah. we do whatever AIS policy suggests and, and don't really worry about it. Um, about seven, eight years ago, I, I had some folks that were interested in an open reviewing. And I said, good, write a proposal that explains exactly how you're gonna do that. So if somebody wanted a special issue on say global IT, and they said, here's how we're gonna open this up to anybody who wants to review or any IAS member or any of some subset. And here's how we're gonna make a final decision such that if it worked, we could expand it to more things. And if it didn't work, we could say, thank you. It was a worthy try. Uh, I'd be open to that. I think database might be open to that. ACM certainly is in general. Um, AIS probably would be. I am not in favor of charging authors for open access. I think libraries and schools should. Now, in some countries, this is a problem because the schools won't pay for access. And um, it's, it's, it's a bigger problem. I know this from ACM work. It's a bigger problem than it seems like it. Uh, nobody, it's expensive to maintain digital libraries. And nobody really wants to be the one paying for it. I don't like authors paying for it because it seems like it, it could lead to too much corruption in contrast to libraries. Thank you. I could say also sure. we've received papers in this topic as soon as they are related with some uh, uh, Latin American issues. So it's fine. Guys, just want to remind you that if this shuts because uh, uh, we're, we're, it's time for us to, to leave here, we can continue our talk in our social <laughs> time area, right? I, I think I've sent the link before. So go ahead, uh, Aurora. <laughs> Okay, that's that's fine. I already state that we uh, we will be very happy to receive those papers and uh, as much as they are in in our topic in our area of, of the research, which is uh, a, a MIS in Latin America. I would like to, to thank everybody who attended uh, this. Uh...